You know, I've seen a few comments online and uh, on social media where it mainly comes from AA cult members and it comes from people who are very pro uh, treatment center and pro 12 steps will often say that uh, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy in Quackaholics Anonymous is the same, it is pretty much the same, basically, like the 12 steps or uh, what did one person call it, spiritual CBT. Uh, which I, I found to be really a joke because, I mean, the 12 steps and the CBT are exact polar opposites. Um, but there's a lot to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, it would be impossible for me to cover all of it, uh, even in one or two videos. Uh, it covers a wide variety of different things. But uh, I did actually have some experience with cognitive behavioral therapy a few months after I got away from the cult. Uh, and it was, it was really helpful to me. You know, I, I credit it in uh, getting the right medications uh, to be an instrumental in helping me overcome my own problems with addiction. But, um, I, and originally how I got into it, I got lucky really because, you know, too often times I found out in the, in the, in the medical community when it comes to addiction, when you're, actually trying to seek help for your addicted problem. Uh, you have to almost cut through uh, barrier after barrier of red tape to find some medical professional that's not either uh, all for AA or all for sending you to AA or, or is an AA member. I mean, I've seen so many so-called substance abuse counselors uh, that, you know, they practically were just there to recruit for their cult. It's a little bit, uh, well, it's a little bit... Uh, frightening when you think about how much they've infiltrated uh, the medical community to the point that, you know, you've got doctors that have absolutely no idea what goes on in the rooms of AA, but if you tell them you have a drinking problem or if you tell them you have a drug problem, uh, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to tell you to, you know, go to AA. I think actually that's starting to, that's actually starting to change a little bit. It's kind of, of an uphill battle. It's going to take a while probably before you know, the, the whole entire disease notion is completely overturned, but I, I think that it's actually in the beginning stages. Uh, for example, I remember when I first started going to Quackaholics Anonymous back in, it's almost scary to think about how long ago it's been. It was in early, no, it was late 2002. Uh, and it, it's really hard for me to convey the, the way the world was working back then in regards to addiction. I mean, uh, pretty much every mainstream article, any mainstream magazine or, or the internet in general, it was all strictly pro 12 step. You might could hope to find maybe a, a book that was critical of it. You might could hope to find maybe uh, something somewhere that might question the efficiency of it. But overall, uh, it was pretty much it was pretty much everywhere you turned, everywhere you looked, everything was pointing to, to AA. Something that's not as common in today's world. I mean, you know, people like Stanton Peel, even though they were around back then, uh, they're a little bit more easier to find. You know, I think probably with the advent of social media and things like that, it made it easier for people to connect to one another. I remember some of the early message boards, uh, they weren't too much evolved from what they were like in the 1990s when I used to play around on those. But, it, you know, pretty much it was all overwhelmingly 12-step. And... Uh, I got really lucky. Uh, I was going to a place. Uh, it operates in the city for people that don't have any insurance, uh, and and there was a whole lot of requirements to get into it. You had to, you had to be at least working a part time job, and you or you had to be in school, uh, and you had to qualify for it through you know a few other. It was it seemed like a mound of paperwork I had to go through in order to get into it, but uh, I was able to get, you know, a medical doctor, and I was able to get. Uh, even some professional help. At the time, I wasn't interested in talking to anyone, really. I, I've said it before in other videos. I had just gotten out of AA, and I didn't have no interest in, you know, the possibility of any more group therapies. I didn't want to talk to anyone one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't want to do any of it. I mean, I was just, I, I was completely fed up with talking about myself and talking about problems. But of course, just because you've escaped from a cult, uh, a cult that does not treat your addictive behavior, it doesn't mean the addicted behavior is gone away. And as a matter of fact, the addicted behavior was still much, you know, very much there and present. 
Uh, and, you know, towards the end of my time in AA, I was just drinking myself to death anyway. Once I got out of AA, it was, you know, it was kind of a, kind of not much different than life uh, in AA. You know, I was getting a few little mild dry spots here and there, followed by drunkenness, etc. cetera. Uh, and then I, I went through a frightful period of insomnia. And uh, that's actually what led me, when I saw the doctor uh, through this, you know, organization I was talking about that operates here for people without insurance, uh, I started telling the doctor what was going on with me and everything. And I was really worried because, you know, if anybody out there uh, has ever been through the ringer that's the medical community when it comes to quitting drinking, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, doctors in general seem to have a very unsympathetic view of people, you know, who have it, or they just pass you off to AA or something like that. And I, it was just luck, I guess, that they said there was someone uh, who they could allow me to talk to. And interestingly enough, he wasn't uh, some uh, seasoned professional that had years and years behind him, you know, because, you know, you are dealing with a place where you don't have any insurance, so you don't always get top notch. Uh, people are top-notch care. I'm not complaining about them, though. They've been great for me. I'm still using them. Um, but the guy was an intern, and I sat down and I talked to him. Uh, they had recently put me on medication. That was the right amount of medication that I needed. I'm still on those medications today. It's made a world of difference in my life. But uh, <clears throat> but he was listening to what I had to say and everything, and he, he said that he had uh, an idea for something called CBT, would I be open uh, to talking to him with it about it? Uh, and you know, I didn't know what CBT was uh, at the time. And, and actually, CBT encompasses a whole lot. It would be impossible for me to accurately describe every facet of CBT. You know, in two or three videos and four or five videos, etc. But it, it was a very basic form he was going to work with me about. And what he said was is that CBT primarily deals with your perceptions, it deals with learned behaviors and automatic thoughts. Now, you know, right here, some 12-step asshole would probably want to jump up and say, oh, that's what we do in AA. Well, there's a major difference in the way it's handled in CBT and the way it's handled in AA. AA is just going to give you negative reinforcement. AA is going to tell you, you know, you think the way you do because you're a sick alcoholic, you behave the way you do because you're a sick, diseased alcoholic, and... Ultimately, their advice is all going to go back to the same thing. They're going to tell you you need to go to meetings, and they're going to tell you you need to get a sponsor, and you need to work steps, and that's all you're ever going to get. You're not ever going to get any closer to actually finding out anything about you as a person because in AA, you can't do that. In AA, you're taught that you're powerless and that you're sick and that you can't, and, you know, self-knowledge is totally discouraged. CBT was quite the opposite. Uh, the first thing he introduced me to, it was really quite simple, was he was saying that everybody, uh, he said myself included, he said, but, but judging by the way you're telling me about your history, your background, and what you're going through right now, uh, you have a habit of catastrophizing, is what he called it. It's, he said it's a psychiatric term where the uh, best example I could give for that would be, let's just say you wake up one morning and you find out your tire is flat and you know you're going to be late for work uh and you start really getting upset and you start really freaking out and you feel like breaking some windows or you feel like punching something or you know and you start screaming and uh he was saying at the core you're not really upset so much about the flat tire as you are the fact that you feel uh as though you're kind of helpless which you really are in that situation i mean you've had some a shitty thing happen to you and it's got you upset, but deep down inside, you're actually afraid of, if I can't prevent this from happening, what else can I prevent from happening? Uh, you know, uh, if this flat tire can happen today, what could happen tomorrow? My transmission could go out. I could get, I could lose my fucking job because of all of this. I could this, I could that, I could. And he was saying, what you're simply doing is taking a basic situation and you're turning it into a catastrophe in your head. And the first thing he said, it was very, very simple. It was, it was just a method of snap your fingers and say, stop. And when you stopped for a second, you took a breath, you were supposed to start refuting uh, all the chaotic uh, catastrophes that you were creating in your mind. For example, you would say something like, okay, I've got a flat tire. It sucks. I'm going to be late for work. That sucks. 
But this is not a catastrophe. This is not the end of the world. Uh, I'm not going to die from this. And it, there's no... Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that things are only going to get worse today because of it. You kind of refute your own anxiety with your own mind. Something you don't do in AA. AA would say, well, you got a, you know, you got upset over that because you're a egotistical alcoholic and thinks everything should go your way. And you was trying to run the show and blah, 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 blah. Uh, the, the thing he was introducing me to here was a way that you realize that a lot of the automatic thoughts that pop up into your head, and he was saying this isn't, you know, the, the main thing that, that really stuck out to me was he was saying this isn't i mean he said i don't necessarily know about what they teach in aa because i was talking about it a lot you know but he said that's not uh something that just people with addictions do that's something everybody does and then he looked at me and said hell man i do it you know he said i wake up sometimes in the morning and if my computer mouse isn't working right and i can't get the thing to navigate i start catastrophizing i think you know oh my god my computer's gonna break down and i can't afford to buy another one and i don't know if i've got my files all backed up and you know this could be terrible and uh they said you know everybody probably well, the majority of the time whether they realize it or not they have a tendency to do it it's just something uh that happens and but cbt actually uh teaches you a way to take your mind and to refute what's going on in your head to to overturn it to realize that you know 99 percent of the problems you have in your life a lot of the times as far as your stress your stress is re related uh mainly to, to mental things it's not necessarily the situation itself it's a mental issue that you're telling yourself it, it's something you're convincing yourself up there. and there's a way you know to actually I guess you could say not just so much refute yourself as it is to pull back for a moment and say, wait a minute, I'm making a deal out of this when there isn't a deal to be made. It was kind of what he started working with me, you know, on in the beginning. And, you know, it was sometimes it was very simplistic, like uh, CBT, the, the, the level he was giving me, or the brand, I guess you could say he was giving me, it, it doesn't really focus much on the past. It focuses on what's going on with you on a day-to-day -day basis. It focuses mainly on the patterns of your thoughts and, and, you know, kind of just paying attention to your thoughts. It's really, you know, quite simplistic uh, being aware of things. But, you know, I mean, uh, to uh, to give a couple of real life examples, I remember, uh, and of course it turned out to be okay, but I, was, I had gone to a doctor, <coughs> freaking sinuses, uh, I had gone to a doctor uh, shortly around the same time and he said my blood sugar levels were high for example, uh, and of course, that's not really shocking. I mean, when you've been drinking about a half gallon of vodka a day for as long as I've been doing that, I mean, they, they, you're probably not in picture perfect health, but he had said that I was in danger of becoming diabetic. Uh, and I remember, you know, when I got outside the doctor's office, I started thinking about, you know, I'm diabetic, you know, I'm going to have to uh, make lifestyle changes or I mean I'm gonna have to take insulin uh, you know I knew a guy who you know lost his leg because of diabetes you know I've heard of type 1 diabetics going blind I just got into a real panic state you know and I had to you know kind of pull out the CBT toolbox there and I said wait a minute okay I don't I don't have diabetes you know I don't actually I'm not been diagnosed with anything all that happened was the doctor told me that your levels are high and well, you've been, you know, I've been abusing alcohol for a long time and I'm not abusing alcohol anymore. So logically speaking, if I stop abusing alcohol and I start, you know, taking care of myself a whole lot better, chances are that the so-called blood sugar levels that I'm worried about will probably decrease. I was able to pull myself out of a, a state of panic. Uh, what AA would do, on the other hand, is tell you that was your disease talking and you probably are going to die and you probably you know deserve that because that's what you did to yourself because you wanted to run the show and you wanted it your way and then they tell you to go to a meeting and then they tell you to turn it over and then they tell you to talk to some sponsor about it who's just going to reiterate the fact that you're helpless and you're powerless and you're hopeless and, and, and on and on and on there's nothing at all remotely correlated between the way the 12 steps teach and the way cbt did uh, CBT actually uh, to get into some other exercises that I did I wasn't in therapy forever you know either that was another goal of CBT I remember the guy said 
Uh, my goal is to get you out of here, not to keep you here. Otherwise, you'll develop a dependence. And he said, you know, a dependence on a psychiatrist or a dependence on a professional is also unhealthy. You'll start, you could possibly start transferring uh, all your issues over to me. You'd start thinking I'm the, you know, the one to solve all my issues, all, all your issues for you. You know, he even said, if you really think about it, all I've done is an hour a week with you. Uh, the rest of the time during the week, it's you who's actually making the choices uh, to use some of these CBT tools. It's you that's making the choices to do these things, and it's you who's choosing uh, to try to do things that, that help you, you know, lower your anxiety to lower uh, a lot of other mental issues that's going on with you. I'm not doing anything. That's completely opposite to what they tell you in AA. In AA, they tell you, you know, you can't do anything by yourself, that you got to have uh, a God, and you got to have a sponsor in the steps, and all you know, it's reinforced helplessness. As a matter of fact, I, I do remember us having a conversation about AA and the idea that you're diseased for life, or the idea that you're always going to be sick, or the idea that you know you can never get better. Uh, and you know, at the time being fresh out of AA, I used the same terminology. A lot, I would refer to myself as sick, or I would refer to myself as, you know, I would even say things like, how sick is that? Or let me tell you something that's really fucked up about myself before I would present some real world issue to him. And, you know, each time he would say, that's not fucked up, that's not sick, that's not twisted, there's nothing about that that's twisted. It's very, very normal uh, to react the way you're reacting to situations. Uh, you know, like, for example, uh, not too long ago, I had to use it, even though it's been years since I seen the guy, I went to a job interview and it, it didn't, it wasn't a good one at all. And when I stepped out of the job interview, you know, I was thinking to myself, well, maybe I'm not really qualified to have a job like what I'm trying to get into. Maybe, maybe those interviewers, you know, you, you ever walk into a job interview and you just know that they don't like you, you know, they kind of give you this look of, you know, and then they ask you a question, they're sort of sitting there like that, and they're sort of writing down shit while you're talking, and you, you know, some part of you wants to just stand up and say, oh, fuck you, you know, you're not going to hire me, you know, whatever. But, you know, ultimately, there was this part of my mind that wanted to catastrophize that. I was saying to myself, well, maybe I'm not qualified, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm not that. And I had to literally do the CBT thing and say, you know, wait a minute. It's one job interview, okay? I've got maybe 30 applications floating around right now. It's one lousy interview that wasn't even going to give me that good of a job to pay for that much anyway. I mean, there's no point in really stressing over this. Now, in the past, if I had brought that issue up to him, I would have said something like, well, you know, to show you how fucked up I think, uh, you know, to show you how sick I am. And somewhere along the way, I don't remember how far we were into the therapy sessions when he said, you know, did you ever think about the fact that if you constantly say things all the time, like how fucked up is that? Or how sick is that? Or let me show you how really twisted I am before you say anything about yourself. Has it ever occurred to you that you're constantly giving yourself negative reinforcement about everything you do? Even if it's something very normal, when you have to say something like, how sick is that? Or when you say something like, you know, to show you how fucked up I am or something like that. He said, you're kind of mentally programming yourself uh, with a lot of negative reinforcement. You're constantly telling yourself that you're all these terrible things. He said, when you're just having real world, real life issues. I mean, you know, and he said, in, in one way, I kind of see... Uh, <clears throat> you know, how that could have helped uh, develop some very detrimental ways that you look at yourself because you're always referring to yourself as sick. You're always referring to yourself as, you know, totally fucked up, you know, and he said, you keep telling yourself that you're going to start believing that and it's going to, it's going to greatly hinder any progress you're going to make in the real world because you're always going to think of yourself, you know, as inherently flawed. And it got me to thinking about how much AA taught me you know, to always question my own motives, to always question my own thoughts, to always never trust my own actions, to always, you know, go against, you know, what was that bullshit I used to hear in meetings, you know, whatever you're thinking about doing, just go opposite, you know, to what you're doing. I mean, how fucked up in the head is that? <laughs> to quote their own crap back at them. But it occurred to me that over time in AA, I developed a sense of negative uh, perceptions about myself, even though I'd never really, I never was really, you know, some 
uh, overconfident, arrogant asshole that thought, you know, he was the greatest thing on earth or anything like that. But, you know, I think everybody to some degree, shape, form, or fashion, if you're even remotely healthy, has some kind of doubts about themselves or some kind of lower self-esteem, you know. And uh, AA actually kind of took that and preyed upon that. And what does it do? It constantly tells you each and every day and each and every meeting that you can never get better on your own, that you can never develop a sense of worth about yourself without them, uh, that you can never actually come to a place where you yourself can... Uh, can mentally fix yourself. You know, that was just such an alien concept to me in CBT that, that he's telling me that all I got to do is, is sit back and, and try to refute my own thoughts. And in doing that, I would learn better coping abilities where I wouldn't have to actually worry about uh, letting catastrophes drive me over the edge with anxiety and things like that, that I could actually do this on my own. It would, in fact, that was the one thing he kept stressing to me over and over during our, I think, a couple of months together. No, it was more like three months together. Uh, that was the one thing he just kept drilling in my head. You're the one doing this. I'm not doing it. I mean, you're the one who's choosing to take your medications. You're the one who's choosing to come to therapy. Uh, you're the one who's actually sitting down and writing down real-life situations and how you apply it to it before you show it to me. I mean, he said, you know, you could have very easily just came in here one time and said, you know, this is fucking stupid and never come back. I mean... And to me, that was that was that was such a radical idea at the time. After being an AA for so long, the 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 idea that I could do things on my own. I mean, I know how infantile it must sound to say that your self confidence in AA was so broken uh, that you didn't have any confidence in yourself to solve anything, that you didn't have any confidence in yourself to do anything. I mean, I know what that must sound like to someone who hasn't been through the cult and, and the devastating effects the cult can have on you. But it was, it was really just, uh, that was so, that was almost so alien to me that I barely even recognized it, you know. Uh, I don't even think I could have recognized it had I not been so uh, disgusted with the, with the cult religion of AA to the point that I had left it, to the point that I knew that the crap they were preaching wasn't true. I think if you would have probably introduced me to this CBT shit, uh, five years before I quit the cult or six years before I quit the cult I wouldn't have been able to accept it I would have heard uh, you can do this on your own you can think on your own and all that and I would have probably run from it I mean I'm embarrassed and ashamed to admit that but I, I really think that the cult was so deeply ingrained in my head that I actually don't think I would have been able to understand the fact that what they had been preaching me and what they had been telling me was wrong because kind of like what he was talking about with the negative reinforcement the more I told myself day in and day out that I was sick and the more I told myself day in and day out that I wasn't like other people and the more I told myself day in and day out that I was always going to be hopeless uh, the more I was con convincing myself of the truth of, the th of these things and that's one of the reasons why I believe AA is very harmful and one of the reasons why I believe it's very dangerous and you know I get really irritated when I hear people say there's good stuff about AA if you listen to the doctrine of what AA preaches and what it does to people there's nothing at all remotely good about AA at all uh, anyway that's uh that's kind of where what I wanted to touch on in this week uh, and uh hopefully I'll see you guys next time I have no idea what I'm going to talk about but you know I never do know what I'm going to talk about until I actually start recording to be honest until next time